Ever since I was 18 years old and got heavily into the world of self-improvement, I've had this fantasy in my head. Babe, hear me out. You, two girls, ketchup, and fidget spinners all around my <clears throat> Dude, not that fantasy. What if I made reading my full-time job? Monk mode, intense lockdown, immersion, going all in on self-improvement with books. Would I come out the other side happier, enlightened, better understanding of the world, or would it just be a giant waste of time? Or could I even do it? Well, I decided that there's no better time than today to give this wacky fantasy a shot. This is my challenge, reading seven self-improvement books in seven days. But first, let's go over some ground rules. Each book must be read cover to cover. Each book must be read in 24 hours. And at the end of each day, I'm going to give you a three sentence summary plus my favorite big idea. So by the end of this video, you'll have seven of the best ideas from around 40 hours of reading. The seven for seven challenge is officially on. You've heard that success isn't an overnight act. People don't really look into failure stories because let's face it, if someone fails, we think it's not inspiring. Show us your cards, show us your plaques, show us your wealth. So people leave them out or they skip over them. This book leads with failure stories and how your success and failure in life isn't that you avoid them, but you push through them. Sometimes the obstacles standing in your way are actually on the path towards getting what you want. Thomas Edison was 67 years old. He returns home after a long day at his lab inventing cool shit. Gets home, ready to take a load off, and some dude comes rushing to his door, screaming at him, you gotta come quick, your lab is on fire. He arrives and sees his lab with all his inventions, all the way up to the seventh story building, green flames are spewing from it. You know that scene in Game of Thrones where it all goes up and it's green fire? That was his lab. So he pushes his way through the crowd of bystanders, all the way to the front, he grabs his kid and he says, go get your mother, she's gonna wanna see this. His kid looks shocked. Dad, are you okay? She's never gonna see a fire like this one again. Now to put this in context, dude just lost decades worth of prototypes, one of a kind inventions, research, all turned to ash in front of his eyes. At the time, all of that equated to around $1 million, which in today's money, is around 20 to $25 million. When the reporter asked him the next day why he isn't more worked up and distraught, like, dude, what's gotten into you? You seem pretty good. He said he wasn't too old to make a fresh start. Maybe there was a hint of excitement in his voice that he got to. As a true inventor or artist, that was exciting to him. The story concludes that that year was a breakthrough year for him. Within a month, two months, his men were back in the factory, business as usual, working. They made over $10 million that year, which equates to around 200 million in today's dollars. I know he has some sketchy stories about stealing other people's inventions. Push that aside for now. But this isn't a sappy story about like, rah, rah, you can do it. Success comes to you when you work really hard. No, this was a dude who was 67 years old and his life's work in one night in front of his eyes is on fire. And he rebuilt. Because what other choice do you have? I'll tell you your choices. Option one, you can sit, feel sorry for yourself, blame other people, blame circumstances, and let it break you. Or number two, knowing that that number one doesn't get you what you want, if success or inventing things is your calling, you don't have another choice but to start rebuilding. No amount of worrying or complaining or bitching is going to bring those inventions back and go back in time and save your building from seven stories of fire. Yet when things don't go our way, how many of us sit there and complain for a month, a year, a decade because it's too hard for us to rebuild. I got news for you. I haven't lived 67 years. I probably can't even compare to Thomas Edison. Homeboy invented the light bulb I'm filming with. But how many of us just quit so easily? If your goal is to become a content creator and oh, my videos get 500 views. What do you think mine got the first year? That's how everyone starts. That breakup, I'll never find love again. You think that every single person married happily with the love of their life, that was the first person they ever dated and married? Very rarely does that that happen. But at the end of the day, you don't have a choice if that's what you really want. You can view yourself being punished or you can view it as being prepared. You can view the breakup as a breakdown or it can be a breakthrough. And what you'll learn is that some of your best growth comes on the other side of a crisis. That those obstacles just might be the way. I'll see you back here tomorrow for day number two. Hopefully we're good. But yeah, rugged. Lesson learned, don't cheap out on tripods. But have you ever heard of the 
4 a.m. club. Day two. Another book recommendation from you guys. Seven hours estimated read time. Here we go. Halfway through, now's a good time to fill you in on one of my biggest hacks for getting more reading. Let's face it, sitting and reading can get a little boring, monotonous, same old, same old. Maybe it's the ADD in me, but sitting still and reading for seven hours a day is pretty tough. Even in college, I was never able to do it. But share something with you, don't make fun of me. Puzzles. For years, I've been obsessed with audiobooks while doing a puzzle. I found that it really helps comprehend taking the psychological workload off of your brain by doing so. In fact, it got so bad that I had just a bag full of puzzles. I had to take the storage unit because my girlfriend was like, Clark, get your puzzles out of the house. Just piling up. Start with why. Simon Sinek, you know the drill. Three sentence summary and then the biggest takeaway. I'll do you one better. You can summarize this book in one sentence. How's that? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. That's literally 200 pages summed up. Here's my favorite concept from this book. Think of yourself, your business, your life as three circles. And in them, you have three things. Why, how, and what? Stay with me here. Simon Sinek says the way most people go about marketing, leadership, is this. What they do, how they do, and then maybe they break into the why. And as you can tell by the giant red arrow, this is the wrong way to do it. He uses the example quite a bit in the book of Apple computers. We make beautiful computers. They're simply designed and easy to use. Want to buy one? The problem with that is that's not very inspiring. You're competing on features. You have to rely on manipulations, he calls them. Better price, more options, scarcity, price drops, all these other tactics that are short-term and short-lived. What if there's a better way? The alternative, you gotta find a way to go from the inside out. People who inspire do this. MLK did a I have a dream speech. His why, not a 12 step plan for equality speech. The plan is important, but if you don't get people bought into the why of what you do, if you don't buy into it yourself, if you don't know why you get up in the morning, it's gonna be really hard to motivate other people and let alone yourself. So here's what Apple computers, everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. The way we challenge the status quo is by making beautiful computers that are user friendly. We just so happen to make new computers wanna buy one. You look at their brand, it's pretty much a cult. All in all, this book was phenomenal. I will say here that that he has a TED talk, was one of the first ones I ever saw, I believe back in 2009. That's like 18 minutes. I think that pretty much gives you everything in this book in 18 minutes instead of six hours. So definitely add that to your watch later list on YouTube. Not that this book was bad by any stretch of the imagination, fantastic writer, speaker, author, I'm a huge fan, but revolutionary concept and solid read. Woo, not gonna lie, that one uh, was longer than yesterday's. Or maybe it just felt longer. Maybe I'm getting tired already. Reading stamina, is that a thing? Good thing I'm choosing a short short one tomorrow to recover. Why did I do this challenge again? Maybe I should ask myself why. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. You guys want to see the height of luxury? Everyone thinks it's cars, designer, restaurants. No, 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 no. I don't mean to flex on you this hard, but these are the backdrops. And in the old days, you had a little pulley here and you'd have to go over there and shimmy them down. Not anymore, baby. Check this out. It's the little things. Day number three, The Alchemist. You know the drill, three sentence summary, and then the favorite idea from this book. The Alchemist is a story about a boy shepherd who embarks on a treasure hunt all the way across the world after he keeps having recurring dreams about treasure. Along the way, he falls in love, gets robbed, meets mentors, but most importantly, finds out what it means to focus on what truly matters. This is textbook hero's journey if you know Joseph Campbell. And it was beautifully written. Very simple, easy to comprehend, especially for me, because I comprehend things at a fifth grade level. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not deep. In fact, I think that's probably why since the 80s it's sold millions and millions of copies. The biggest idea and my favorite one from this book, it's very easy. It gets repeated throughout the entire book and it's the theme, the one giant theme of it that the universe conspires to help people who are clear on what they want. Napoleon Hill calls this a burning desire. Society will call this your dream. Spiritual people call this manifestation. Paulo Coelho in this book refers to your life's calling as your duty. I love that, here's why. Some people think that pursuing their dream is somehow selfish or self-centered or it's all about you. That couldn't be further from the truth. Although some people do pursue things out of self-gain, selfish motivations, the concept of duty is really strong because 
because you don't actually have a choice. If you were meant to make art, if you were meant to be a musician and you're not, everything you do is going to be miserable and you're not gonna be the best version of yourself for the people around you're you. You're always gonna have in the back of your head, I should have done that. I should have made music. I should have toured in a band. I should have made art. And you're gonna feel less about yourself. You're gonna feel inauthentic when you go into work and you're probably gonna treat the people around you worse because when you're at your worst, you're not your best. And the people around you are gonna sense that. And I know this with working with literally thousands of people, um, seeing and hearing people's duties and having realized one myself, what I'm doing now, uh, which I'm so fortunate to have achieved. People know what to do, they're just not doing it. And it remains a dream for them. This is a concept I call a success fantasy. That the daydream becomes so pleasurable of you being that musician and touring in a band and selling out arenas, that if you actually start making changes towards it and moving there, you realize that it might be further away than you thought, it's harder than you thought, it's a road paved with setbacks, failures, frustrations, people who wanna tear you down. That can be really intimidating and hard and, and let's just call it what it is, just suck. Painful. So most people stay in the dream phase because at least that's pleasurable. But ultimately, if that's what you really want, you don't have a choice. Because you're gonna be less than what you could have been all along and you're gonna feel worse about yourself and those around you. You might get married with kids and resent them because you feel like subconsciously they're holding you back, which is a lie. You can still pursue your dream no matter what age. And if there's one belief I firmly believe, it's that it's never too late and you're never too old. My metamorphic program, that's literally what we do is help people realize their duty, their life calling, their 2.0 version of them, give them a game plan to move towards it and get out of their own way with all these subconscious fears that hold them back. We have people in there who are 50, 60 years old, just completely demolishing and crushing. And it is my favorite thing in the world. I get chills thinking about it. When someone comes in super discouraged, down, depressed even, some terrible head spaces that we've worked with, and they come out the other side in 10 weeks full of joy, confidence, their vibe is higher, because they're pursuing what they knew they should have all along. So that's what this book's about. It's about going after your duty and what happens along the hero's journey. And spoiler alert, you might just find that the treasure you're seeking is right below your feet. I'll see you back here tomorrow morning for day number four. Spare closet I got. Serves as overflow for all the books. Of course this thing's like on the bottom of the stack. Jenga. Day four, Alan Watts, The Wisdom of Insecurity. Also one of your book recommendations. Three, four hour read, let's start. It's 2 p.m. which means I got two hours of calls with our clients. Hands down my favorite part about what I do. Some of the one-on-one -on -one work with people. In 30 minutes, some magic can happen. And then later tonight, we're going to a rock show. Going from Wisdom of Insecurity to Metal. This song is called The Wisdom of Insecurity. Three sentence summary and then my biggest takeaway. Guess when this book was written. If you had to guess, Wisdom of Insecurity. It seems that the world is more anxious than ever. And when you boil it down, what we're anxious about tends to do with what's going to happen in the future. We anticipate it, we feel anxious. This book is all about how to bring your attention back into the moment, how to cope with the fact that all of life is change. The anxiety never ends if you're always anxious about what's coming. You would think that a book like this about anxiety was probably written in the last three years. This book was written in 1951. That's 70 years ago, very ahead of its time. The big idea from Alan Watts is the backward law. Breathing. This is something you do, you're doing now because you're alive watching this video. What if you say breathing is so important I don't want to release any of it. I don't want to let go of my breath. And so you and hold it in. Just gonna keep this breath in. You'll eventually have to take a breath because you're depriving yourself of oxygen. Love is another example. If you think of a house on a hot summer day, there's a breeze going through your house. You say I want this breeze to last forever. So what do you do? You close the windows, you shut the doors, you pin up everything that has a crack that the breeze, breeze can escape from. And what does that do to the breeze? It kills it. It ceases to exist because you tried to cling on to it so tightly. A flower that you hold in your hand and never let go of, you pick it and it starts to die. This is the backwards law that the more you try, the less you have. And so the more we try to anticipate things in the future, the more anxious we feel about them. The secret is to stop trying. I don't know if it's necessarily practical to stop trying. It doesn't necessarily help just knowing that. That's why it's more of a practice, a practice of letting go. Some food for thought for tonight. I'm excited for the book we're reading tomorrow. It's very different than the ones we've been going through. 
have been wanting to read it for a while, but just never gotten around to it. But tonight we got a rock concert to go to. You guys want to see some metal? All right, I'll throw a little in here. Here you go. You guys guess what it is yet? The puzzle? Now's a good time to show you. Astrology. You know what's so funny about astrology? People who base every negative trait about themselves on their sign. I'm a Scorpio, it's just what we do. Yeah, but Jessica, you literally didn't pay the Uber driver and threw up in his car. <sighs> Scorpios, you know us. Geminis, that's just what we do. Brittany, you told your dad that you wish you were never born and that he was a pathetic loser. I told you, Geminis, we're crazy. <laughs> Oh, one other thing we have to do in the morning. Bird feed time. This bird watching creeps up on you fast when you hit 30. Let me tell you, you don't even notice birds in your 20s and then as soon as you start hitting 30, you're like, is that a horned beak rock dove? Wow. Concert last night was a blast. Today we got day five, we're reading The Psychology of Money. Now this is a book I've seen all over the charts. I started it, but never finished. We're gonna learn how to get rich, guys. Overall, the challenge has been a challenge. Not gonna lie, retention seems to be the hardest part about this. When you're consuming 200 pages a day of new information, hard to really retain everything you read because you're just on to the next one, on to the next one. But I'm not a quitter. I'm still getting takeaways, I'm still learning, and I'm having a lot of fun making this video with you guys. Let's get to work. Day number five, Psychology of Money Complete. About a five hour read. This book in one sentence and then our favorite big idea for you. The premise of this book is doing well with money has little to do with how smart you are and a lot to do with how you behave. It's also why it's called The Psychology of Money. Here's my favorite idea. It's actually a story of Ronald James Reed. For 25 years, he swept the floors at JCPenney's. He was a janitor. That holds a special place in my heart because I got my start as a janitor too. In 2014, he died at the age of 92. And that's when that humble janitor made international headlines. Guess what his net worth was when he died at 92. Remember, he's a janitor, blue collar guy, humble beginnings, lived very simple, simply. You wouldn't have any idea what his net worth would be. But if you had to put a number on it, what would you guess? A couple hundred thousand? Maybe a million dollars? How can a janitor save a million dollars? He was worth over eight million dollars. Most of the people had no clue. Ronald Reed didn't have any special knowledge. He didn't have any special advantage. He was extremely disciplined lived humbly, and invested in blue chip stocks over decades. Pretty much it. And so I love that story because oftentimes we think getting rich is about earning a lot, starting a business, and those things can help. But I'll never forget one conversation I had in Seattle, where I used to live. I was out at a bar. Uh, my girlfriend at the time brought some of her friends. You know anything about Seattle? It's a pretty liberal city. I'm not gonna get into politics here, but it's important for the context of the state. Because it's a trend I see going around and kind of the complaining that people do about money. She had just graduated college with an arts degree she was struggling and she was frustrated why she couldn't get a high paying job. The rich evil 1%, they're greedy, they're sleazy. It's just a bunch of rich men at the top who wanna oppress you. And I was like, okay, although I can see where you're coming from, I understand your frustration. What do you think their secret is? They make so much money in the stock market. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know you can invest in the stock market too. There's no income cap. It's not a rich person's club that you have to work your way into and once you have a million dollars, okay, we'll let you invest in the stocks, congratulations. Double doors open in a cigar-filled room. They hand you a satchel, the guy from The Alchemist. You're now welcome into the investor's club. That's not how it works. Let me prove my point. Look at this, that's Apple stocks. $140 gets you a share of that company. Most people spend $140 on random Amazon one-click purchases that they throw away in two months. Let's just be real. Stories like Ronald Reed really emphasize the fact that it is a lot of discipline and time. Those are the two most important factors you can have with investing. Maybe you didn't grow up where people invested around you. I totally get it. And look, we don't have time to debunk and preface everything with, oh, generational wealth and systemic problems. and We're just not gonna do that. So please don't leave comments with saying, Clark's just telling me to pull myself up by my bootstrap. Because that mindset right there is giving you a story of why you can't. And as I just showed you, if you can find $140 and you have time and you have decades and you can compound and you have half an ounce of discipline, you can't. And books like this will tell you how. What is this, the late night rant session? Finance after hours? That's a fun topic. We don't get to talk about it a lot here on this channel, but I love finances. All right, see you back here tomorrow. We're doing day number six. 
Morning. I'm actually starting to put the edit on this video and I'm realizing how much meat is in here. 49 minutes on day five. So I'm gonna keep day six very brief. But let me know if you like this sort of behind the scenes vlog style. Personally, I think it's more fun to watch sometimes than just one giant lecture. And you get to know someone when it's not so scripted. Today's book is three essays by Michael Singer. Laws of Karma, Will, and Love. Huge fan of Michael Singer. He's written the book, The Untethered Soul, which got really popular, you may or may not have read. He also wrote one that's less known, but I think even better, called The Surrender Experiment. Amazing story with that guy. Three sentence summary, love, karma, and will are three important topics that govern everything in your life. There's a chapter dedicated to each, and he breaks them down in very simple Western terms. It's kind of like a band writing three singles instead of a whole album. I really like this change of topic every chapter. My favorite big idea from this is the law of karma. Again, keeping this light, a very simple worldview of karma is the law of cause and effect. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that nature has natural laws? Hopefully you'd say yes, because if I drop this pen, there's a natural law of gravity in effect. And unless you believe the conspiracies that gravity is fake, that's an example of something you can't see but is affecting you 24 7, 365. Even when we're talking spiritual concepts, skeptics will say, oh, you know, I only believe in science. But when you boil things down to the smallest quantum level, there's things that you can't even explain and they're still trying to figure out. There seems to be an intelligence that governs natural laws. So where are we going with this? Back to the law of cause and effect. Sometimes people say that their life is random or why do things always happen to me or why am I in this situation? Chance is the explanation or bad luck, but I love the law of cause and effect to explain a lot of things. And a lot of times you can't even see the cause. It might be so small, but you're dealing with the effect. Take the simple example, gossiping in a workplace. You think it's harmless when you're talking smack about someone and then maybe a month, two months down the road, that person tells the other person and it gets back to them that you were talking smack about them. They might not even confront you, but they're definitely gonna treat you differently. They might report it, you might not get a promotion, all because of that one cause. And you're dealing with the effect that you didn't even know about. Where is this coming from? Why does everyone hate me? Where is it coming from? Positive example of cause and effect. You have one teacher who inspires you at an early age on a certain topic, sets you off on a totally different trajectory for 20 years. Cause and effect is always working in your life. Just like that gravity, whether you can see it or not, doesn't matter. Whether you believe in it or not, doesn't really matter. So what's the application from this for you? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I always try to act in accordance with my 2.0 identity. There's this highest version of ourselves that we all have, because if you're operating from your highest self, you're gonna get the highest cause. And then what happens in life? You get the highest effect. So when you start shifting into this 2.0 version of you and really living at the level that you're capable of, your life's gonna get so much better. It's gonna raise everything around you because you're operating on higher causes and you'll get higher effects. Beautiful little book. I'll see you back here for day number seven. thought we'd get outside for day number seven. Today's book is one that I chose. It's The Essential Writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now, I did not read the whole 800 plus essential pages, but I did read Self-Reliance. This was an essay written in 1841 for some context. It's an essay that I come back to and read time and time again, every single year at least. I own three copies in a book format, but you can find it online for free. Three sentence summary, and then we'll give you the favorite big idea for day number seven. Ralph Waldo Emerson championed individuality, really pioneered what it meant to embrace the whole American dream ethos. Not just to do good, but to be good. His essay, Self-Reliance, is in a world that tries to get you to conform, be average, be mainstream. That's not good. You don't want to be on the side of the majority because the majority is overweight, psychologically unhealthy, don't like their jobs, don't like their life. To be great is to be a non-conformist, to have a sense of self reliance. A couple points that are on one central theme of this book that speak out to me. There's a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Part of being an original is being a nonconformist. And every single one of you watching right now you want to be a nonconformist because the highest version of you is original. That's the most authentic expression of you and that's all you should be trying to do is express and bring that out. But it's not always so easy because anytime you break away from a crowd, you'll have people trying to pull you back. Another part of being a nonconformist is being able to change your mind. Commitments are important. Holding your word is important. Living in integrity with your beliefs and values is important. But what I love about Ralph Waldo Emerson in this essay is the emphasis on being able to change your mind even though it contradicts what you once thought. In fact, he says, speak what you 
think now in hard words, and tomorrow, speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it should contradict everything you said today. Is it so bad to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood. Socrates and Jesus and Luther, Galileo and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. There's another quote that says that foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. You're not bound to who you were a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. And I think that so many of us, when we're trying to make these changes, we feel like we have to live up to who we were in the past. You're never too late to make a fresh start. And ultimately, if you want your future to be radically different than your present, you're gonna have to make some changes which are gonna come with resistance from other people or maybe even yourself. But if you never give yourself that permission to evolve as a person, you're gonna be stuck conforming to who you were in the past. You're not even gonna give yourself a chance to make a fresh start and change. The 2.0 you is not just a replica of the 1.0 you, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this video. There was a core belief where I was so scared to be more authentic because I was afraid of being misunderstood. Ah, oh, but people can take it the wrong way. And oh, I can't, you know, you're having a one-way conversation with someone, they can assume all these things and put words in your mouth and oh, he's saying this when really, you're, you know, it's not what you meant. The less worried I am about being out of context and misunderstood, the more vulnerable, the more raw, the more authentic I am, I feel like the more people's hearts you reach. Because if you're always just understood, you're just mainstream. And if you're mainstream, you're really not saying anything that hasn't already been said. And you're kind of just making noise. So that's been a huge recommitment of mine the past six to 12 months, not being afraid to be misunderstood. Not everyone's gonna understand you. Not everyone's gonna like you. It's like 350 million people in America alone. What are the chances that every single one of them likes you? Zero. If you wanna be great, you have to be comfortable with being misunderstood. That's a part of life. That's a part of your work. That's a part of the 2.0 you. Definitely one of my heroes in terms of self-improvement, Ralph Holder Emerson. All right, day number eight, little different setting. Here's what happened. Last night, going to bed and I hear screaming upstairs and my girlfriend is telling me to come quick. Sweating profusely, vomiting, diarrhea. Clark, you need to call 911 right now. So we did, they arrive, come into our apartment, assess her and they take her to the ER. So I was there until 2 a.m. and then this morning went back and I've, I've been there all day ever since. And I'm not gonna include any medical details here, respect her privacy. I may or may not put this in here until I ask her permission. It just felt really inauthentic to go home and do day eight, here's what we did. All right, here's the book, you know, because things like this happen and life gets really real. Day number eight, I had set out to read this book right here, Marcus Aurelius Meditations. I've read it briefly in the past, but it just hit extra hard. Stoicism is very real self-improvement. You know the self-improvement that just tells you don't worry, be happy, think better thoughts. Who cares that you're in the ER right now? Just think positively. Like when life gets really real, really fucking real, that shit doesn't work. And if it does, you're so disassociated from what's going on in the world, that's not healthy. We're in the ER, but you know, everything's great. We're doing really well. So what I love about stoicism is that it's real for when real shit comes up and for the last 24 hours comes out. Marcus Aurelius was one of the closest things we ever had to a philosopher king, but when you look his lifestyle, lived very humbly, practiced what he preached, although we'll never know for sure, but the people who've written about him says that he did. And this book was never supposed to be published. It was all internal writings to himself. And what he talks about in here is how you can never directly control what happens to you, but you're always in direct control of what you do with it. That is the one sentence summary of all self-improvement. And it's the cornerstone for a fulfilled life. Because everyone thinks that self-improvement is supposed to make you happy. Stoics weren't necessarily concerned with happiness. They're like, happiness, what do you even mean? You can do things that seek pleasure and they're very easy. Drink, don't take care of yourself, you know, hedonism, pleasure, more, more, more. The problem with that is that you burn out, you crash and burn, and then uh, like a dopamine hamster wheel, you need to keep it spinning, spinning, going faster and faster and more and more. You'll eventually fatigue out, crash and burn, and it's not healthy. They used a word called eudaimonia. I'm not a translator, I'm not a scholar, but loosely translated means fulfillment. Happiness is a byproduct of when you are fulfilled. And when you look at Marcus Aurelius's life, Death is a very common theme, hardship. A lot of the great people you look up to, life was not just 
happy dandy, everything's okay, don't worry, be happy. They were tested. They were living in the world. They weren't secluded from it. They didn't do self-improvement in a vacuum. And you shouldn't either. To retreat to the caves and isolate yourself from the problems of the world actually isn't the goal. The goal is to live in the world, live in the challenges, embrace struggling and the suck, and still find a way to flourish through it. And that's why I love stoicism is because it gives you roadmaps and frameworks to do so. Control what you can, accept what you can't, and have the self-awareness and the wisdom to know the difference. All right, sitting in a parking lot, talking to a camera like a crazy person with horror movie lighting. People in the Starbucks are like, what is that guy doing? But it's okay, I'm a stoic. I don't care about their opinions, right? Why does thy rely on the opinions thou shall not control? So as you saw in the video, my original plan was to do 10 books in 10 days. And then I had some personal things come up and we had to cut it to seven and seven. It's a week later. Unfortunately, my girlfriend did make a full recovery. So thank you in advance for your thoughts and energy. So would I do this challenge again? I do not think so. Now that is not to say I didn't learn anything from this and this was a total wash. The biggest problem I had was, what do you think? Surprise, retention. I retained a decent amount, but not nearly to the extent as when I'm not rushed, I'm not doing a challenge, I don't have to cram a book in one day. But if I had a ton of time on my hands, I'm not gonna lie, this was a blast. Let me know if you get this, but I get off on new ideas. I've always been wired that way. Like when someone's connecting the dots and you hear how they figure out a puzzle piece of life and it fits in the perfect spot to where you're at, it's a dopamine hit. You're figuring life out. And in hearing other people's stories, you see yourself. I think that's why I've always loved the self-improvement industry. Not to become some enlightened version that has all the answers and doesn't have any struggles anymore, but it's because it's never ending. The self-improvement is small incremental improvements that compound on themselves. I found it extremely motivating to have a challenge like this. I found myself waking up looking forward to not only reading, but sharing big ideas with you. So the format itself, I loved it from a content creation standpoint. The perfect next follow-up for you would actually be this video I'll link up right here. It's how I remember everything I read. I'll go over eight different hacks that you can use to remember more of the information you're reading. Man, if I had had more time during the days, I could have doubled or tripled the comprehension I got from these books. Go check out that video, but more importantly, use one, two, three, or all of the memory retention hacks I share with you. I'll see you there.